Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we are having a conversation today on the SEI Code of Ethics and Standards. My name is Kathy Halley. I am the Legal Affairs and Ethics Manager at SEI. And with me is Banu Joy Harrison, Licensed Clinical Social Worker and SEP. Um, Banu, would you like to talk a little bit more about yourself and welcome? Yes, welcome. It's great to be with you in conversation about ethics. Ethics is a topic that is very near and dear to me. Um, I am a clinical social worker in the state of New Mexico. And a little bit of my background, I um, was a body worker for 11 years in the 80s and 90s and taught at a massage school for 34 years. And I have taught ethics to body workers and social workers and counselors for oh, probably 25 years now. And so ethics and right action is very near and dear to me. And I received my SEP in 2003. So I have been uh, using somatic experiencing in my clinical work for getting close to 20 years now. So it's very exciting. So I have a PowerPoint that I created that can will highlight and just give us some context about the new SEI code of ethics and standards. So I think I'm just going to jump right on there. All right. So what we're going to be covering today is a, a preliminary kind of a basic introduction to the code of ethics and standards and answering some questions about why we have a code now and the purpose of a code. We're also going to be talking about the concepts of right action and discuss role power and intention versus impact. And then we're going to cover a few specific important sections of the code that you can familiarize yourself with. So that is sort of the overview for our conversation today. So why are we doing ethics now? So ethics is an important part of every um, modality, every organization, and SEI is growing and becoming global. And we are wanting to um, have our organization hold ethics in, in the forefront of our attention, as opposed to just sort of a background kind of thing. Um, this particular ethics code and standards is at this time going to apply just to SEI training environments, SEI staff and students, and it's actually a live document that we will be ongoingly updating as the need um, arises. So right now, this code will only apply to SE trainings in the United States. The most important piece of having an ethics code and standards is to have consistent um, descriptions of behaviors and approaches in our trainings so that there can be consistency no matter what training you attend. And it will ensure greater safety for everyone. And throughout all professional licenses and organizations, professional organizations, they always have ethics codes and standards because it provides a clear expectation of the behavior that's expected by its members, its providers, whether it's a massage therapy code, whether it's a professional organization like my National Association of Social Workers, all of these have codes of conduct and standards um, for their members. The SEI um, policy also includes a grievance procedure that addresses situations um, where there's an avenue for people that have situations where breaches have occurred, where there can be some remediation and healing. So that is part of the grievance procedure that we'll just briefly touch on later in the presentation. So 
as I've taught ethics for so long, I see ethics as right action. And right action and ethics is more about a, a stance, it's more about a position of how can I be aware of my behavior, my language, and my intentions that move me in the direction of right action with clients, with colleagues, with students, and also with the awareness of how am I using my role power as a clinician, as you know, a provider for SE sessions, whatever position that I'm in. And with this awareness, we can create this inner witness, this inner awareness where we can be aware of our behaviors and speech and learn to shift them so that we can reflect the values that we each hold, but also that SEI holds to create safety, inclusion, acknowledge diversity, and the awareness of our privilege and positionality. So SEI's move towards a more formalized ethics and grievance policy is basically making explicit to everyone what has always been implicit, right? Behaviors that increase safety while teaching others to help mitigate the effects of trauma. So our code of ethics and standards, um, we are gonna be implementing them in all trainings and courses to support SEI's core values. Students are in a unique position, no matter their licensure, but they're in a unique position to learn, you know, right action, right conduct in the context of trauma training. And so the SEI's values, <clears throat> their core, core values is we wanna support and foster and nurture hope and empowerment lead with empathy, understanding, and compassion, deliver professional education in the spirit of innovation, creativity, and research. We wanna deeply cultivate trust and safety in our communities, in our trainings, through acceptance, equity, inclusion, and unity, and then to inspire new possibilities and restore resilience through increased organizational capacity and self-regulation. So this code of ethics and standards is gonna cover, um, you know, faculty, SEI staff, assistants, coordinators, students, providers. It's sort of a system-wide um, acknowledgement of how we want to show up for our organization. So any talk about ethics, you have to talk about power. So ethics and power. So this is a quote from Cedar Barstow, who wrote a book on um, ethics and power. And I'll just read it to you because I think it's really important. <clears throat> ethics in the context of right use of power is having the awareness of the impact of our personal and role power so that we can prevent, reduce, or repair harm. It offers us a chance to be compassionate, to be in integrity with ourselves and others through right or appropriate relationships. And so this quote really, for me, identifies this right use of power and the acknowledgement of <clears throat> my personal power, my role power, so that I don't cause harm, right? Do no harm is a first tenant that we can all hold. So I think one of the, the key aspirations and intentions in trainings is to create safe space. So I did a lot of assisting with SEI trainings from beginning through advanced, multiple modules over many years um, working with senior faculty and assisting at Peter's advanced trainings when he when he actually was doing the advanced training. So I feel really blessed to have you know learned from all of these mentors. 
And working to create a safe space and a safe container for the training is really important, especially because we're working with trauma, right? Safety is job number one. Mm -hmm. And in a training environment, what I recognize that everyone is processing safety issues in three different realms, right? So processing within themselves. So I know when I was a student in, and even as an assistant, some statements would like, oh, wow, I need to work on that, right? Like this is really touching my own issues, right? And so working with safety within myself, working at acknowledging areas of growth with my own personal history that, that still needs to happen. So that's one realm. And then in the external training environment, <clears throat> there's so much in terms of logistics, the physical environment, the, um, you know, um, making things accessible for diversity of students, the course material, the breaks, all of these things create an environment of safety, of quiet, of confidentiality, of of you know comfort you know literally physical comfort that is so important for all of our nervous systems to feel safe and comfortable so that's kind of the external assessing of safety and then there's the between right there's always a dance of safety with between faculty between assistants and faculty staff between students with each other, between students and assistants and faculty. So there's this very complex relational dance of safety that happens throughout every training module. So this is one of the key intentions of having an, uh, an ethics code of conduct and standards is to create consistency and expectations of behavior and as you know as the world is showing us the need for trauma informed help and uh, sessions throughout the world um, se trainings are growing and we want to provide this consistency throughout all of our trainings and right now this code applies just to the us and it, who knows over time it might um, might extend worldwide so so role power, this is, I could talk for hours just on role power. So as SEI faculty, staff, assistants, coordinators, practitioners, providers, we automatically have greater power than students in training sessions. This is a power dynamic that can be expanded and multiplied if we also hold power and privilege in other areas such as skin color, gender, financial and bodily security, education, all of these things can shift our role power. And it is so important for individuals that hold role power to acknowledge that and really name it and to notice how that plays out in a training experience. So role power and this power dynamic can set up a lot of transference and counter transference issues in this kind of between realm of safety between us and others it can also trigger issues of dominance and marginalization between students and trainers and assistants and it can also lead to misuse of power the important thing to remember is that you know we're all human and these power dynamics often occur outside of our conscious awareness oftentimes we grow up with privilege in certain areas that you know we may not be that conscious of because it feels normal to us and so part of this um, expansion of ethics uh, of you know our code and the standards is to again make explicit what is implicit within me and within the trainings so students are always going to be looking to the people that are that have more power in training sessions as a model of how to act 
what does my teacher say? What does this assistant say? What does the coordinator say? You know, how are they behaving? What kind of, you know, um, dynamics are playing out? Do I feel safe? Do I not feel safe? And so, you know, as um, SEI staff that hold some power and privilege, how can we be good models to students? Because they will take this further into their ongoing practice um, with SE. By including students in our code of ethics and standards, we are providing a teaching opportunity for them to learn the ethical standards that are really important to provide safe and effective trauma you know, sessions, to be aware of role power and all of these things. So no better time than when you're a student to begin learning these skills. And again, you know, the code and standards will help us be more aware and more mindful of our language and our actions that can have such a powerful impact on students and colleagues. And then the grievance procedures, you know, provides an avenue for growth from both sides, you know, the person that maybe is making the complaint as well as the person that is being complained about. We want this to be non-punitive. We want this to be a growth experience to enhance changes in behaviors and create healing in the affected parties so that we can move forward. So then intention versus impact. As I started studying about role power, this was a relatively new concept, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Um, you know, I know myself and people that I work with that are in the field of healing, right? We have careers that we want to help people and care for them. We all have strong intentions to provide a safe and caring environment for students, right? And I thought originally years ago that that was enough, that I meant well. But I am realizing more and more that I can have the best intentions that I want, but if my behaviors and my words don't match that intention, I can have a very difficult and maybe even harmful impact on students because I am just not aware. And as the world is evolving and things are changing, I have to continually be aware of my language of of things that will help people be, you know, feel safe. So we all need to acknowledge the potential for an impact with our students that may not just be positive and may not match our intention. And if we deny the impact by just saying, but I didn't mean that, or that wasn't my intention, and you know, you misread it, that actually can create further harm and injury. So this acknowledgement that impact on others may be different than our intention is really important and can create, if we're aware of this, and if we begin to acknowledge like, oh my goodness, I had no idea that what I said made this strong impact and make some repair, right? In that quote by Cedar Barstow, it's about reducing harm and then acknowledging and repairing harm when it has happened. So that's an important part that we can, can need to hold. So the purpose of our code of ethics and standards is to provide a clear roadmap of behavior with students and staff and between staff and students to provide appropriate boundary definitions to reduce harm and marginalization, and then also provide a pathway for clearing communications and repairing ruptures. So let's dive into some more specifics about the code. So that was sort of the framework of the code of how kind of the global view of how the intention. And so let's dive into some specifics. 
So the SEI Code of Conducts of Standards of Professional Conduct has two main sections. And for everyone involved in SEI, it is your personal responsibility to become aware of these. Um, saying that you didn't know they exist is not an option because we are stepping, whether you're a student or part of the SEI faculty and staff, we are stepping into a professional role and it is our responsibility to know this and to be aware of these standards. So the two parts of the ethics um, code of code of ethics is the first part is principles. And the principles are aspirational and are included to encourage a high level of professional behavior for all of those that represent SEI. So some of these principles include a commitment to uphold these principles and the standards to develop a safe enough environment so that learning can happen safely and knowing that activation is going to happen in the student body right because we're working with trauma. And so we want to have clear role boundaries appropriate confidentiality clear communication within training environments, so that even if activation happens that there is a good safe ethical holding environment. Another principle is ongoingly increasing our knowledge base and our own personal processes around culture, diversity, inclusion, systemic racism, gender issues, ableism, structural injustice, and so forth, as SEI grows, right? SEI is already global. And so, you know, we need to be aware of a larger and larger context of these issues uh, because they're changing and growing and evolving around the world. And then to acknowledge and skillfully use our role power as staff to mitigate any exploitation um, and increase safety. So noticing if there's some boundary challenges or communications that could be harmful to to be aware of that and to have discussions around that. Then the second part, so that was the principles and there's more principles outlined more clearly in the actual ethics code that would be important for you to read. The next session is ethical standards. So these standards are directive and they set forth enforceable rules for professional conduct. So the standards are things that you must do. And if you, you know, fail to do them, and if a complaint is made about SEI staff, it would land in this standard section, right? That we didn't behave according to these specific standards. So I will just highlight a few of them. Again, I don't want, I'm not gonna be going over the entire code word for word. Um, the first standard is education and training. So for SEI staff to have clarity and consistency with training material, goals, objectives, and requirements for each module that are consistent across all of the trainings, to actually demonstrate competency to teach, to have clear guidelines for feedback and evaluation to students, assistants, faculty, organizers, and coordinators. Confidentiality regarding personal information of students during trainings and personal sessions, understanding the limits of confidentiality, and informed consent for demonstrations within trainings. Another standard is one that is listed as dual or multiple relationships. So a dual or multiple relationship, a definition of it is basically where you have more than one relationship with a particular person. So for example, Kathy, I'll pull you out as an example. You know, we are colleagues at SEI, so that is one relationship, um, but we could be friends. That's another relationship, right? And then if I decided I wanted to do an SE session with you, that would add a third relationship, mm -hmm. right? And the more relationships you have with one person, 
the more complicated and sticky the boundaries can be. And so we really wanted to name this, this area in, in potentially because it, it, holds, um, it holds a lot of challenge, right? So there can be um, sexual dual relationships where there is intimacy, sexual intimacy between, you know, two people that also have another role. And I will just say that sexual dual relationships are never ethical. They are always unethical with students and staff over which you as an SEI, you know, um, representative have evaluative authority. And if you have any kind of license, like I have a social work license and each license will specifically state their position on dual or multiple relationships. And every licensing code that I have ever seen is that sexual relationships are not ethical. There's so much harm that can be created with that. However, non-sexual dual relationships are not always avoidable, right? So there may be, uh, you know, a, a multiple relationship between an assistant and a faculty person that is non-sexual, you know, that perhaps <clears throat> the faculty member has given some SE sessions to the assistant in the past. So they were kind of therapist client, but now they're assistant and faculty right? And they're not always avoidable. And the SE professional the, is always responsible for setting clear, appropriate, and sensitive boundaries around these multiple relationships to support the training environment. So this is actually one area in a, in a subsequent webinar that I will be doing, we're gonna take a deeper dive into these dual and multiple relationships so that, you know, with lots of examples so that we can really begin to tease out um, some of this. Um, standard three <clears throat> covers professional and ethical behavior. Um, staying within your scope of practice. So SE trainings are very unique in that there are multiple types of professionals as students, mm -hmm. right? There are massage therapists, there's social workers, there's counselors, there are psychiatrists, psychologists, there are coaches. And so <clears throat> everyone has a slightly different scope of practice. And so staying within your scope of practice is really, really important, not only for students, but also for SEI professionals when we're in our, you know, um, whether you're faculty assistants or whatever, providers, we have to stay within our scope. Another um, bullet point in this section is respecting the intellectual property of SEI. As we're growing and as more materials and Kathy is well versed in, in this particular area, and then also not engaging in abusive, domineering, or harassing conduct. And in the age of social media, this becomes particularly salient in terms of how you present yourself if you have a social media presence, what you say about anything, what you say about other professionals, what you say about SEI, all of this um, you need to hold right action and professional conduct in the forefront with every single post or statement that you make, right? Because this is a mirror of who we are and the stuff doesn't go away <laughs> either. It's, it, it lives forever. It has its own, own life. So those were some of the highlights of the, F, the Code of Ethics and Standards. And so I invite each and every one of you to read the entire code because it, it is much more specific than these highlights that I've given. Also, I'm just gonna touch on the SEI grievance policy and procedures. So 
An ethics committee has been formed at SEI to review complaints received. And so we have, there's a specific procedure now of, of when someone makes a complaint of how that is handled. And the intention of SEI around grievances and to resolve them is to be constructive, correction, corrective and educational rather than punitive, right? Because we understand that we're all human and we all need to grow and learn and we want this to be something that is productive and educational and corrective and not punitive. So complaints can be filed by the SEI staff, the board of directors, students, the public, SEI professionals, assistants, coordinators. It's, it's really broad, right? Um, all complaints are confidential and the discussion remains confidential within the committee. And there are a few exceptions. Um, maybe at the end, Kathy, you can um, let everyone know where they can find the formal complaint form on the website and mm -hmm. kind of go through some of the some of the details about that. Um, so our, our grievance policy contains specific filing uh, requirements, responses, evaluation, investigation, decision making, right? It takes some time. And just so that everyone is aware, at this time, the Ethics Committee cannot work with complaints about private practice issues, right? So right now, as I said in the beginning, that this code of conduct and standards is strictly related to trainings in the United States. We can't work with private practice issues. So once the Ethics Committee works through its process, they can make recommenda recommendations that range from improving communication, mediation between the parties, more education, professional consultation, or disciplinary action. Disciplinary actions can include a letter of reprimand, probation, suspension, or expulsion. Um, the grievance policy also has a provision for an appeal process. So I would highly recommend that you familiarize yourself with this grievance policy as well as the entire code. So I think, oh, I just, there's one, one more slide. So I wanted to just share with you some examples of how implementation of this code of ethics and standards may look, and especially to students that are coming into trainings. So these are just some bullet points. This is by no means a limited list or the complete list. It, this is just a sampling. So confidential communications with faculty and assistants at meetings and trainings. Offering check-in groups, being mindful of how the groups are formed so that BIPOC and LGBTQ plus groups can maybe form to in, have greater safety. Um, encouraging tangible actions towards inclusions and making authentic repairs when microaggressions occur. An example of that would be giving options for organizing triads for work in different training settings that create safety, especially for marginalized groups. And then, you know, if there is a multiple relationship, you know, having the SEI professional or staff person think to themselves, like, what might be some potential losses for students if there is a multiple relation forming? You know, what is most important to the student? Is it the multiple relationship or is it the SE training? And to really exercise some discernment in, in multiple relationships, understanding your own scope of practice and not going outside of those boundaries, and then educating students on effective and appropriate communication within trainings and on social media, interacting with students, um, talking about activation, all of those things that are so important to create uh, a holding environment that is contained and safe and trauma-informed. So 
This is where you can find the code of ethics and standards and the grievance policy. There's a page for it. You can contact Kathy. Here's her email. And I think I'm going to stop my share and we can see if I missed anything, Kathy, and you can go over some maybe some more nuts and bolts. Yeah, just a couple things. Um, the web page that uh, was shared on that last slide, it also includes the code of ethics, the grievance procedure, as you stated, that's also where you would find the grievance form to file a formal grievance. Um, we do actually have a complaint form and a grievance form, and the complaint form is going to be more for administrative stuff, like if someone is unable to get registered in time and they're upset about it, there's that form. And then we have the grievance form, which is for grievances related to ethics. Both are on the same page, but they're they're spelled out and defined quite well um, on that ethics page. And it also includes frequently asked questions. And it will include this recording as well as upcoming webinars on ethics um, all on that page. So any questions, that's probably going to be the first place that I would say to go um, for a resource and reference around ethics if you have questions. You're always welcome to email me at the legal at trauma healing email. And um, Banu, I just wanted to give a little bit more on the private practice situation because we get that question a lot. Um, what we do if somebody reaches out and says that they have an issue with somebody in a private practice situation, generally what we're going to do is we're going to tell them as soon as we can after a meeting with lawyers, we have determined over the months with the committee that we cannot address private practice issues. So we try to tell them that now up front, but also we encourage them to reach out to the licensure um, of the person in question um, based on their state and what role they have. That would be our first point would be, you need to reach out to their licensure board if they have one, because they, like you said, have a much often more stringent code of ethics and they have expectations on those behaviors that might be something that is more tangible and easier to follow. And they do generally get covered with private practice issues um, depending on the role that they have. So we encourage that first and foremost before discussing anything else. And we do even ask, even if you have applied um, or sent a grievance in to their licensure, did you do that? What, you know, what was the response if you did that? So. We ask those questions and we also have as a committee determined that we generally like to know the physical safety of how someone's feeling. So I will reach out and say, you know, we have received your grievance um, just so the committee is aware, do you feel physically safe if we were to start addressing this grievance? And that way you have people that at least have the opportunity potentially already having re-triggered themselves to even file this grievance, they have the opportunity to say if they feel physically safe or not. Mm -hmm. um, we can't address every feeling of, of feeling unsafe, but we can at least make sure physically that the complainant is in a good place when we review this, that they don't feel threatened in any way physically. So I just wanted to put that out there too as a small thing because we, we do have a couple um, bits. Like you said, there's much more in the code of ethics and the grievance procedures to how we address things. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to give a little bit more detail on those small That's topics. Great. And it, it really shows that, you know, there's been a lot of care and consideration in crafting this committee and this code and the grievance policy. So, yeah. um, you know, I think everyone should know that it, it, this is not just a quick thing that's been happening. <laughs> so, right. And that's the other thing that um, maybe I should share too, is that I am the staff liaison. I'm the point of contact for the committee, but I do not make these decisions. The committee as a whole is the one making the decisions and having the conversations. I kind of guide us with time and do minutes and agendas, but past that, I'm really just the point of conduct or contact. Um, and Anna Paula being the director of legal affairs, and international relationships, she's the one that is reviewing the grievances when they first come in and then deciding if they go to the committee based on the procedures. So just putting that out there too, I, I will happily be in touch with anybody that has questions, but um, I cannot make the decisions. I do not make the decisions on my own. So I just wanted to put that out there as well that um, 
you know, I'm more than happy to provide as much support as possible, but I would recommend the web page to start. And then if there's questions, more than welcome to email me. Yes. And I know, Kathy, that um, every so often there's going to be a little ethics blurb in the newsletter. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone listening to this webinar, if you have any specific questions that, you know, you want to send to Kathy to address in this, or, you know, we can have kind of a, you know, a current question and answer corner around ethics because things come up. Right. I mean, I've been in private practice between my body work and my clinical social work since 1984. And I still feel that I'm growing ethically and that there are questions that occur. So, um, it, you know, this is a living thing and it's growing and changing and developing. And it's important to when you have a question to to seek out an answer. Absolutely. And, and that's a great point. Um, I do have an ethics type up go out about once a month in our SE Today newsletter. Um, currently, it's a lot of the frequently asked questions that we've typed up because we have seen these questions come in. But we would love to get into maybe some situational conversations where we say, oh, you know, person A was in this relationship with person B and maybe address dual relationships like you talked about. Yes. We might do hypothetical situations like that, but we are always, um, you know, looking to see what the community wants to know as far as ethics. What questions do they have that maybe we can address? Um, may not like the answer if legally we're tied for some reason, but um, mm -hmm. we would like to at least address them and look at them and, and know what the community is thinking. Um, especially, like you said, it's it's ever changing. Even if you thought you had a grasp on it today, tomorrow you may not. So. Um, <laughs> I feel like that would be great if we could get some input from the community and see what they have to say about it too. But yeah. going forward, we'll have a couple more webinars coming up um, this year. And then I think one in the beginning of next year. So keep an eye out for those. We will be sharing them on the ethics webpage like we talked about. But in the meantime, Banu, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate you kind of going through all that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for, for listening and and um, being here too. So yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we will see you then at the next webinar. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.